Hello everyone and welcome to section three of guided notes. We skipped section two because we hit section two in class, just kind of teaching you how to use Punnett squares or reviewing, I guess maybe how to use Punnett squares. So in section one, we talk about a, a Greek, or I'm sorry, an Austrian monk by the name of Gregor Mendel. And he looked at pea plants. And when we talked about pea plants, they are something called complete uh, complete dominance or completely dominant. And the idea is you're either going to, the pea plant's either going to be tall or it's going to be short. Uh, it's gonna, the peas are going to be green or they're going to be yellow and there's nothing else besides that. Um, but that's not always the case. So sometimes what happens when we have a red flower and a white flower, we get pink flowers. We get something kind of in between. Or if we take a white chicken and we cross it with a black chicken, we get both traits shown. We get white and black or we get these speckles and that's what we're going to talk about in this section. So there's this idea of independent assortment. And the idea of independent assortment we've talked about, um, when I flip a coin, I got a 50-50 chance of getting heads when I flip the coin. If I flip it a second time, the first flip was independent of the second flip. So I have a 50-50 chance of getting heads the second time. And every time I flip the coin is, in, is a new flip the coin and is independent of the previous one. And that's exactly what happens during during meiosis is how those chromosomes align is independent of the previous one. So when we look at multiple traits, so we have say uh, yellow and a green alleles, and we also have round versus wrinkled alleles, these yellow traits have nothing to do with the round traits. It has absolutely nothing to do, and they're independent of one another. And that's what independent assortment is saying. Is that after showing allele segregate during the form Asian of gametes, meiosis makes sex cells, Mendel wanted to prove that they did, um, that they were independent of one another. So what he wanted to see is if one allele impacted the other, so will all yellow seeds be smooth? So will all yellow seeds be smooth? So he took a yellow round and a green wrinkled, and when he did that, that cross, what he found was all four were yellow and had no effect on the, the wrinkling. So we can do these things called dihybrid crosses. A dihybrid cross is really when you just look at two traits. I'm not a huge fan of dihybrid crosses because this Punnett square gets kind of tricky. There's a different way we can do it where we can actually do two different Punnett squares of single traits and we can kind of accomplish the same thing. But the idea of a dihybrid cross is if we were to go through and we look at two different um, two different traits, what kind of, do they influence one another? So what he did is Gregor Mendel crossed homozygous round with homozygous green, homozygous round with homozygous green, and this is what he got. But of all the pea plants that he made, now remember, these are not guaranteed results. These are possible outcomes. However, all 16 of those boxes have the exact same possible outcome. So 100% of the time, he got um, yellow and round. So if he took those yellow round, so the what we call the F2 generation um, is what we get here. The uh, P generation is the parents, the F1 generation is the offspring, uh, and then if you take those offspring of the F1 and you cross those, then we get the F2. That's the idea of this. But then what he did is he took this heterozygous, heterozygous uh, mom, and he, he crossed it with this heterozygous, heterozygous, heterozygous dad, and he got a Punnett square that looked something like that. So if you note, it doesn't, we don't have all round yellow this time. We get some greens popping up, and we also get some wrinkled that are popping up. But note that the greens and the wrinkleds aren't all necessarily connected, right? So they are independent of one another. So what this did is it proved or has evidence to suggest or to, to support the law of independent assortment, that these genes independently segregate or separate during the formation of alleles or sex cells. And the idea that one gene does not influence the other. Now that doesn't work in all situations. For example, when we were looking at traits, freckles, most research that we quickly did found that skin, uh, I'm sorry, hair color had a connection with freckles. So that's not true with all traits, but it definitely was with these pea plants. So Mendel went through and he summarized these, that characteristics are determined by genes that are passed from parents to offspring. 
huge takeaway that we get our genes from our parents, right? We know this today. They didn't know that then. That some traits are dominant over others, right? Yellow is dominant over green. Tall is dominant over short. That's the idea that Mendel came up with. And that each sexually reproducing adult has two copies of one gene. One came from mom and one came from the dad. And that these alleles segregate independently. The yellow color of the pea has nothing to do with whether it's round or wrinkled independently. Now, there are traits that go that are different than this. Okay, so it's not always tall or short. It's not always yellow or green. It's not always round or wrinkled. There are some times that they're in between, or we see both, or we even have more than two traits, um, or there's multi poly means many genes for one particular trait. And that's the idea. So the majority of genes have more than two alleles. It's not just a simple thing that Mendel happened to pick pea plants and do and make observations on. It's much more complicated than that. And in us, that's not the case. It's more, most of our traits, I should, maybe I shouldn't say most, many of our traits are more complicated than just tall or short, round or yellow. Uh, I'm sorry, round or wrinkled, green or yellow, like they were in pea plants. Um, so some are, sometimes we have more than two possible common, uh, outcomes or alleles that could be passed on. We could have more than one gene are controlled or we have some of these other things. So what is incomplete dominance? Well, dominance means it's going to overpower, but incomplete means it's going to be somewhere in between. Okay? It's going to be somewhere in between those two phenotypes. Incomplete is in between. So if we have a red flower and a white flower, what's in between red and white is we get a pink flower. So if we took this red flower and this white flower, 100% of the time, we are going to get this pink flower that is in between. Now, uh, let me go back to this. Some people might think that this is, uh, this is the blending hypothesis all over, and that would be true. However, if we were to cross this with this, a big R, big W crossed with a big R, big W. What the blending hypothesis would suggest is that once we blend white and red, we're going to get pink, that we would only ever get pink back out. However, that's not the case. This one would be red. This one would be pink. This one would be pink. And then this one right here would be would be white again so we actually get all three colors coming back out so not blending hypothesis it's in between um it's called incomplete dominance co-dominance is when you have more than one dominant trait it is not a blending okay it's not in between we see both phenotypes at the same time so if we have a white chicken and a black chicken and it's a co-dominant trait we get this thing called like a checkered or a sometimes i think it's referred to as a modeled so we see both black and white feathers on this bird okay and then the idea is if we were to take these and we were to do a cross with a big w big big B, big W, we would again get black back out, we'd get white back out, and we'd get checkered. We'd get all four results just like we did in the previous thing. Okay, that's co-dominant, where both alleles are dominant. Co-dominant, both phenotypes will appear. Then we have this idea called multiple alleles. So, you know, we're talking about it's either black or white. It's a B or it's a W. It's a it's an R, it's a big R or a little R. And there's only two possible alleles. Sometimes there's more than two possible alleles, right? That's what multiple allele is, is more than two. So a person, an individual can still only have two because they get one allele from their mom and they get one from their dad, but there might be more than two in the population. That's the idea, okay? You as an individual can't have more than two, but there are more than two in the population. Human blood type is an example of this. Okay, there's blood type A, there's blood type B, there's blood type O, there's blood type AB. So there's really three different, there's an O allele, there's an A allele, and there's a B allele. Or in this example, we could talk about different types of furs of, different, of, of a rabbit. Okay, there's more than two alleles. 
And then we have this idea of polygenetic traits, and the, the idea of polygenic, polygenic traits is that um, a trait is contr controlled by more than just one gene. So, for example, our human skin color is controlled by four different genes. So we don't just have uh, one skin color or the other. We have a variety of skin colors, right? So we have multiple different variations of skin colors because it's four different genes that all combine to give us the variations of the skin colors that we have. It's polygenic. Many genes control a trait. So if we kind of put this all together, Mendel's focused on plants. However, there was a guy by the name of Thomas Mor Hunt Morgan who wanted to see if this really happened in animals as well. So he picked fruit flies, small, easy to keep, produce lots of offspring, reproduce in a very short period of time. There were those pesky things that we get on our kitchen counters when we bring in fruit that's starting to ripe, uh, starting to ripen. And Morgan concluded that this also applied to animals, and yes, humans as well. Prior to that, we did pea plants. We didn't know how human inheritance worked. It ends up that based on Thomas Hunt Morgan's work, we found out that, yes, it was. Uh, also, this did carry true or hold true in animals as well. That's not discount the effects of how appearances are based upon the environment. Okay, so we've kind of talked about this before too, but the idea is characteristics of organisms are the result of interactions between genes. That's what we've been talking about is genetic makeup make us look the way we are. However, there is an environmental factor. What the environment is that you live, and that could be a variety of different things. So for example, a sunflower, the genes affect the height and the color. However, the environment, like the climate, the soil, the water, et cetera, also play a role in how that sunflower is going to look. So genes are the plan where the environment is how the plan actually unfolds. So you have genes, you live in a certain environment, but the combination of those two make you who you are today. And that could be behavioral things, that could be how tan you are, that could be hair color, that could be a wide variety of things. If you're deprived of appropriate nutrition, you might not grow like you should have as a child to the full height potential if you're malnourished, right? And I don't, that's not, doesn't really affect us too much in the United States, but the idea is it can Im have implications in other, in other people in other countries. So our environment definitely plays a role. Sometimes we throw that idea of nature versus nurture. The idea is the nature is our environment. I'm sorry, um, the genes and the environment are what we... Um, our kind of our nature and our nurture. So the environment we live in is the nurture. Um, that could be your parents. That could be um, the environmental conditions themselves. Is more than just looking outside the window. It's your your upbringing. But the genes are the that's the the nature kind of piece. So that's the idea of um, what Gregor Mendel's original things didn't discuss. And this is kind of the gaps in between. If you have any questions, 